Um, I'm here today to give you an overall view of the world of dementia as seen from the caregiver perspective. Uh, the dementia we will be talking about is a progressive dementia, a dementia that uh, it starts little by little with some uh, small indications that something is not quite right, enough to give pause to family and friends, but not yet enough to um, justify a visit to the doctor. So what do we do then? Um, I wrote this book ahead of dementia because when you start f seeing those symptoms, you have to start taking action. And you have to be one step ahead of dementia. Dementia keeps progressing and increasingly getting worse, causing problems that we will be talking about today. But if we are not one step ahead of it, those problems may result in financial ruin, in bodily harm for the person with dementia, for the family member, for others in the community. So we need to put uh, security systems in place before uh, things go wrong. And that's when a lot of people have difficulties and they come to us asking for what to do. We are not born uh, and educated to be dementia caregivers. Who here went to dementia caregiving school? <laughs> right? There is no such thing. And when a loved one gets diagnosed, you are thrown into a role of caregiving <laughs> without any previous knowledge of what it is that you're facing. So um, from the years I've worked at the Alzheimer's Association, people came over, I worked with over a thousand families, and people came over and over and over asking me the same questions. So uh, throughout the years I wrote uh, numerous articles um, based on the questions people were asking, <laughs> trying to give them a solid real world answers. And the book is a result of those articles and the years of answering the same questions. So here I have an opportunity to go in depth into uh, every single aspect of dementia care. However, I do that in a very direct form because uh, you will see dementia caregivers are busy. <laughs> they don't have much time for a huge compendium or encyclopedia on dementia care. They want the answers and they need them right away. Um, first thing that a dementia caregiver needs to know is uh, recognize the symptoms. And, you know, it only seems as if you were doing something <laughs> when you're worrying. So a lot of people tend to worry about, about the symptoms and not do anything about them. Um, the symptoms can be um, m memory loss. Memory loss could be recent memory loss. Um, like I remember very well my years in school, my years in college, having my children. I do not remember what I had for breakfast though. That's the kind of memory loss we're talking about. Uh, challenges in planning and solving problems because everybody thinks that dementia is lack of memory but it's much more than that. We have um, uh, problems in memory but also in perception, in attention, in judgment, in reasoning, language, abstraction, organization. So at very early stages of dementia, you will start seeing uh, deficits in some of these areas. You know, it's okay to do a bad judgment call once in a while, but dementia patients will be doing really bad judgment calls much more frequently than before. So what do we do when we see some of these changes happening? Even though they may not be yet interrupting daily life, but they exist. Mother has always been able to bake wonderful cakes and now she's messing up, messing up all the, the recipes, putting too much sugar, things, things that she would not normally do. So if you see this kind of problems, that's the first thing we need to do. Get a diagnosis, get that person to the doctor, get some help 
for that person. Because it may be that the memory problems and other cognitive problems that we are seeing are uh, something that maybe can be treated easily. It could be a vitamin deficiency, it could be an imbalance with hormones, it could be medication interaction, it could be a number of other things other than dementia. So um, first thing is getting that person to the doctor and that's when the family member hits its first barrier. How do I get to the doctor? Somebody who doesn't want to go to the doctor. Most often a person, when a person is experiencing loss in some of these areas, uh, a person is scared, is afraid. They know what's ahead. They know that dementia is a horrible diagnosis and they don't want to do anything with it. They want to continue living their life normally. So um, the first thing that we need to help a family with is communication skills to get that person to the doctor and not because you're forgetting things, not because you've done things wrong, not because you forgot to pay the, your taxes or you're sending checks signed with no numbers in it, not because of that, but because there is hope that doctors can possibly help you. You see the difference in approach? Other hurdle, finding a knowledgeable doctor. Not every doctor is equipped to diagnose dementia, much less to treat it. So most doctors, they, they may give a little question and answer um, to the patient, which is not enough to diagnose dementia. And, um, and the family is left with no assistance. So when finding a doctor, I always recommend, it has to be a neurologist, a brain doctor, right? And it has to be a neurologist who is specialized in dementia care, which uh, not every doctor, neurologist, is specialized in dementia care. So you have to find the right doctor. And finding the right doctor, also you have to make sure that you're getting the right evaluation. You don't want a doctor who is in a hurry and doesn't do blood tests, doesn't do uh, scans of the brain, doesn't do a complete physical and psycho uh, evaluation for the patient. And only then you may get an uh, accurate diagnosis or not. Early stage dementia, you may not get an accurate di diagnosis. You may have to come six months later, another year later, to get a second look to see what are the changes in the brain and in the personality and in cognitive skills to find out the right diagnosis. And then if you get the diagnosis, you need to start really, really learning about it and understanding because changes are going to be dramatic and they are along the way. And with that, since we're here at Hospice of Santa Barbara, I want to bring up the point that that's when the grieving process starts for the caregiver. So the grieving for the caregiver does not start when a person is um, like clinically dying or, or passed away. It starts at the very beginning of the process here at diagnosis. Imagine a husband and a wife team. The husband starts developing cognitive skills and now he has dementia. So all the future they have planned is gone. Uh, all their finances that they have amassed are going to now be uh, used for something different than they have planned. The wife comes home, she is no longer the wife, she is now the caregiver. And all that conversation that we have with our loved ones when we come home, all that intimacy has changed. They are no longer partners, they are caregiver and patient. So grieving really starts here. And it's a, a very detrimental thing because it's at this point that the person who is in charge of um, providing safety for the person with dementia is so stricken with grief and having to make some life-changing, really important decisions 
to uh, the home, the family, the care, under a lot of grief. So it's so important that organizations like uh, Hospice in Santa Barbara who can provide grief counseling and assistance this early in the development of the disease is vital for the caregiver. Now the caregiver is going to first cope with the news. What is it that they are facing? Is it Alzheimer's disease? In 70% of the cases, it is Alzheimer's disease that's causing the dementia. And if it's not Alzheimer's disease, it could be one of these three other very popular <coughs> dementia causes, vascular dementia, um, when the blood vessels start failing. And most people who have vascular dementia are above 90 years of age. Lewy body's disease is another um, common disease nowadays that causes dementia. Um, and temporal dementia, frontotemporal dementia is to me the one that um, it's mostly most difficult for family members because it affects your behavior right away. People become uh, intolerant, um, sometimes aggressive, agitated, very difficult to deal with. And frontotemporal dementia is the one that affects behavior the most. And until very recently, doctors didn't know how to differentiate temporal dementia from Alzheimer's. So if you ever hear Alzheimer's patients get violent, that's not true. Actually, Alzheimer's dementia patients, they tend to get much more docile and, and nicer as the disease progresses. So, but sometimes they still have the stigma from being confused with frontal temporal dementia. And if you think that you're alone, that doesn't, that is only happening to you, no, you're in very good company. Um, dementia is very, very frequent. Um, it is estimated that uh, one in every two seniors in the age of 80s will have dementia. That's 50%. So pretty much if you're not going to have dementia yourself, you might end up taking care of somebody with dementia. What do you do? What do you do next? Start understanding the diagnosis. Whatever the diagnosis is, you need to know everything there is to know about it, to know how to care, how to know when it's a symptom of the disease or when it's a, a natural thing that's happening um, with that patient. Um, understanding the diagnosis, I put there four, four different diseases that may cause dementia, but there are over 50. Those are the most common ones. Yes, go ahead. So then these two different ones, like the vascular dementia and the frontal temporal dementia are separate than the diagnosis of dementia itself? Or? Great question. Let me go back to this very stage, uh, very one here. Uh, let's see, here. Uh, dementia. Dementia itself means that your brain is not operating correctly. It doesn't mean that you have a disease. Mm. You know, it, it means that there's something wrong in these areas of your cognitive functioning. That's all there is. That's the name, dementia. Now, Something is causing the dementia, right? People don't get dementia for no reason. Just as much as we don't get a fever for no reason. If you have a fever, there's something causing the fever and we need to address. The same thing with dementia. If you have dementia, something is causing. And if it's not one of these four possible causes, it can be another, any one of 50 others. That's why you need to go to a really good doctor, a, a really good neurologist, because to each one of these, the treatment is slightly different. So understanding the diagnosis is going to be vital in terms of providing the best care for the patient. And then adapting to changes in relationship. You're no longer a spouse. You have all the spouse responsibilities, but you know, your privileges are fading quite quickly. Or your child and parent relationship is going to change. Some of the saddest cases I've seen is when a child gets dementia and the mother and father <laughs> are the caregivers. So everything changes when that happens. 
I tell all my families, first thing, if you haven't taken care of legal and financial, financial planning, do it now. Do it right away. Don't wait until dementia evolves to make these vital decisions. Um, you have to do legal planning for your personal issues. What do I want to happen to me when I can no longer speak for myself? Who is going to make the decisions when I am at the doctor and I cannot say what it is that I want? And you know, those are very important decisions and must be made right away. And you know, you know the case, sometimes a family has four children but you only trust three, <laughs> right? So those decisions are to be made now. And also financial issues. Uh, you know, the, the generative diseases that cause dementia, they are three times more expensive to care for than any other disease. More expensive than cancer, more expensive than heart disease, three times fold. So it's an enormous amount of financial resources that need to be drawn to taking care of a patient with dementia. Let's suppose you are successful, you take care of your financial issues, what you do next? Next, you're going to really be involved in communicating with the person who is now memory impaired. And I use this acronym here, DARE. Do not argue, reason, or explain. It doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work. Every, try, every time you try to argue with a person with dementia, you're setting yourself for failure. It's not going to work because they cannot reason. That's one of the difficulties they have because of dementia. And um, they cannot understand steps so they can follow train of thought. So um, arguing, reasoning, and explaining, it's going to get you nowhere. Uh -huh. So what do we do? Disclosure to friends and family is another big issue that a person, a uh, caregiver will have to face right away. I encourage people to disclose as much as possible uh, to, um, you know, and maybe sometimes in waves <coughs> to the closest people and then uh, so forth. Because uh, we have seen families who cho choose not to disclose, like, I want to protect his dignity, as if it was indignant to have a degenerative disease. It's a disease, right? I want to protect his dignity, so I'm not telling anybody. Well, first of all, people are noticing. Yeah, don't think that people are there not noticing when he introduces himself three times in the same dinner party. Um, that, you know, people will be noticing. And other, if you do not explain to people what's going on, you are denying people the opportunity to help you. And believe me, you're going to need every bit of help. This is going to take every resource you, you have and your family, and your friends, and your community, and your church, and uh, organizations in town. So uh, I encourage people to open, but each family will have to have that discussion and do it at their own pace. And I would like to also introduce the concept of recurrent grief. Uh, grief starts at the diagnosis but it doesn't follow a natural path. Natural path of grief, you deal with grief. You go to denial, anger, bargaining, you know, you know the five stages, depression, acceptance. In uh, dementia care, the five stages happen all at once and repeat themselves every day. Every time he forgets something that he knew yesterday, you go through the whole process all over again. Every time he forgets who you are or the name of your children or where you were last year on vacation, every time the grief is, stri is striking you all over again. That's why a person needs continued uh, care and support for grief issues. And remember, they are doing very important decisions while being very much stricken by grief. And uh, it's, uh, it's relentless. It keeps coming back to you. It doesn't get solved so easily. Um, that's for the caregiver. 
at every loss, the process starts again. Now, for the patient, it's fading grief. Because as memory loss progresses, you tend to cope better with the losses that you're suffering with. It's like, I don't care that much anymore. So as the patient is moving to a place that, you know, complete acceptance, things are fine as long as she's taking care of me, I'm doing great. Um, now the caregiver is grieving alone. So, you know, uh, the caregiver is really taking the blunt of the care uh, in dementia care. Self-awareness. A lot of people say to me, you know, he has dementia, but he's in denial. There's no such thing as a person with dementia in denial. That brain is unable to recognize what's going on. It's not that I'm going to explain to him what's going on and he will finally accept it. The lack of self-awareness is part of dementia. So uh, we will have to deal with it, not ha assisting the patient to deal with it. Next thing that a caregiver needs to do is, you know, get themselves ready for a fight. They're going to be fighting dementia, fighting memory loss. So the first thing that every person with dementia, memory loss, any stage needs to be aware of and the caregiver as well, is exercising is the only thing that slows down the progression of dementia, of every dementia, any dementia. Think about that. Not exercising for the brain, for example, uh, crossword puzzles, not that kind of exercising. I'm talking physical exercise. I'm talking pumping fresh blood to the brain, and, you know, exercising. Um, it's the only thing so far that has been proven to slow down the progression of dementia, nothing else. Or neither of the medication and, and none of the miracle cures that come in the market every other month, nothing like that, only physical exercise. So if you have memory loss or a loved one has memory loss, make daily exercise your job, do it because that's the only thing that's really going to help you slow down. The other things are going to help managing symptoms, simplifying the environment, simplifying the home, simplifying the procedures in the home, uh, lighting up dark spaces, making sure everything is safe, uncluttering, simplifying the environment, changing nutritional needs, uh, dealing with them. If uh, is a person is in a, um, on a diet of um, fat and, and meat, let's try to change that. But also, a um, person with dementia may have, at some point, um, not wanting to eat, not being able to eat. So we have to be aware of those things. Um, using art, music, alternative therapies to keep the ambient calm, to give a sense of fulfillment to the person. Promoting sleep. People with dementia sleep a lot and sometimes the families get, oh my God, she's sleeping too much, how do I wake her up? And I'm like, no, no, let her sleep. It's during sleep that the brain reconstitutes itself. So uh, a brain attacked with a dementia disease, dementia causing disease, needs more sleep than normal. So let them sleep. Next thing, keeping your loved ones safe. And uh, first thing everybody will have to do is driving. I wrote here, you know, <laughs> Dave Barry, the one thing that unites all human beings regardless of age, gender, religion, economic status, ethnic background is that deep down inside, we all believe that we are above average drivers. And so does the person with dementia. And how do you convince a person with dementia that they can no longer drive? So there are a lot of tricks to the trade here. Um, and, and that's the very first issue that most families will have to deal with, keeping them safe. The other, preventing elder abuse. Dementia patients are uh, prime targets for uh, elder financial abuse in particular, but also any kind of abuse, because they have lack of judgment. 
So sweepstakes, they are in, you know, if people call selling coins, oh, this is great. And, and, and they are the worst enemies when it comes to protecting their finances. So we have to put procedures in place to help them. If you're going to travel with a person with dementia, uh, you know, uh, every time you take a person with dementia out of their routine and their uh, regular environment, they get an escalation in their confusion levels. So you have to put a lot of um, safety procedures when you're traveling. It's possible, uh, but um, you have to know what you're doing. Minimizing the risk of falling. People with dementia uh, fall a lot uh, because of perception issues. So misstepping, not understanding that th this is the floor. Sometimes there's a misconnection between the brain and the extremities of the body. The, the, the signals may go, but may not come back. And you understand that if you think right now where your feet are, you don't have to look at your feet to know where your feet are, right? Uh, your feet are sending signals to the brain saying, here I am, right firm on the floor. In dementia, those signals they get interrupted somewhere and they don't get to the brain. So they are stepping, but they don't feel the, the signal coming back. They don't know where their feet are. So we have to really make sure that the environment is safe, well lit, free of clutter, especially to minimize risk of falling. And then preventing wandering. Um, uh, Six in each 10 uh, patients with dementia will wonder, and you want to prevent it before it happens, because when it happens, they, it can be fatal. <laughs> Wondering can be fatal. Um, they can get in a lot of trouble. Uh, trusting the power of ice cream. That's my solution for absolutely everything dementia related. <laughs> it's, it's really true. Yeah, you see, just here, nobody here has dementia and we're all already giggling. But um, when you're, instead of arguing, instead of trying to reason, you know, use some positive reinforcement, either as a distraction, you know, when a person gets upset, the best thing, you know, I really understand what you're going through and I'm so sorry, and this should not be happening to you. Let's go and have some ice cream. <laughs> it works all the time. <laughs> it, yeah, it's really amazing. <laughs> So as the disease progresses, and I gave you all a little, a little map of the disease in terms of stages. You know, stages one through four beginning stages. Um, a person can actually live by themselves uh, until stage four. And st stage five and six, they need help. Um, they need somebody to be living with them. And uh, as the disease progresses, we hit stage six, now there is no, no logic anymore. There is no reasoning anymore. It's all about feelings and emotions. That's why ice cream works so well. Uh, ice cream appeals to your center feelings. So this is how we are going to uh, be um, talking to the patients. And that's why we have to learn so much about the disease. It's a whole new way of communicating with people. At later stages, now we're talking stage six here, dealing with difficult behaviors. And difficult behaviors, uh, we don't know what's going to be. Um, I have seen uh, people picking on their own skin and picking on their own skin until they hit the bone and they continue picking if we don't interfere. Uh, we have seen people rummaging around the house and opening and taking all of the stuff out of the drawers you know, putting the house upside down. We don't know what the behavior is going to be, but if we don't have already worked into providing a nice steady routine and a nice calm and soothing environment, these problems will be worse. If we were ahead of dementia and have done everything well, these problems may still occur, but they will probably be lighter than otherwise. Sundowning happens at the end of the day, not because the sun is coming down, a lot of people think so, but it is because that brain is tired. That brain has been working over time all day long to, uh, to just navigate through the world, just to understand what's going on. 
and at the end of the day, it collapses. And it can collapse at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, it can collapse at 10 o'clock at night. Each brain is different. But when it collapses, is crying spells, uh, panic attack. It can be an, a number of really unpleasant um, manifestations. Shadowing is one of the things that people with dementia can do and are is like most distressing to caregivers. Shadowing is I'm behind you and I want to have you in my view at all times. So you're trying to go about your day, you turn around, the person's right here on your face. And, uh, and that goes on and on because they are scared. They feel insecure. They don't know what to do by themselves. They need that caregiver by them, their side <laughs> at all times. Bathing, another big problem. There are medications that can help uh, a family deal with these issues if they arise at stage six, but you really have to have already uh, contact with a very good god doctor. Um, you have to have a neurologist prescribing those and be really knowing what they're doing. Then comes incontinence. Huh? The, the, it, it never stops. It's like the caregiver. Uh, the, you understand why it's recurrent grief? Now we're dealing with incontinence and has the physical tool of dealing with incontinence supplies, cleaning the house in the middle of the night when all you want is to get another 15 minutes of sleep. And the emotional tool of seeing your loved one under so much distress and is a humiliating thing for the person with dementia. And that's when most people will look for um, assistance. I would prefer that persons uh, look for assistance before it gets you know, that advanced um, because it's easier on them. But you see, um, first level of care would be the family, friends, and the community. Daycare centers uh, such as the Friendship Center where I work. Then in-home care, bringing caregivers into the home. Assisted living where a person can go and live 24-7 with dementia care. Skilled nursing, should this person have another physical ailment? Because sometimes, uh, guess what? Dementia may not be the only thing they're suffering from. They may have diabetes, heart condition, arthritis, or some any other conditions that require nursing home, skilled nursing. And hospice care, um, at end of life. So all these levels of care are very expensive. So just for you to have an idea, in-home care um, has two here, right? But should you need in-home care 24-7? Let's suppose you need help inside your house 24-7. It will cost you between sixteen and $18,000 a month. Assisted living with dementia care in our area it will cost you about five, between five and eight thousand dollars a month, which is expensive, but not as much as in-home care. The thing is, uh, only only self. You have to have the funds to pay for it. Medicare is not going to pay for it. Medical is not going to pay for it. So you see, go back to financial planning at the beginning stages, how important that is. Transition to dementia care is not an easy thing. It's a very emotional issue for caregiver and for the person with dementia. So they need help in you know, deciding that they need, the move needs to be done, which is the best house, making the move. And once the person has moved, they need support. You, you can't just put a person in a dementia care home and walk away. You need to provide ongoing support. Hospice services. Um, dementia patients don't fit the regular model for, um, for hospice services, the medical model. The medical model for um, hospice was created based actually on cancer patients, cancer patients who can voice what they need, you know, and, and the doctors can pretty much understand that, that general rule of six months or less of probability of living, right? 
With dementia patients, it's not like that. You can never tell how long a dementia patient will live. You can't. I had a patient with Lewy body's disease placed in a nursing home three years ago, and we were certain that he was not going to be alive for much longer. And we struggled. We finally got a doctor who said, okay, I'll sign and, and give the, the hospice prescription. Um, and then he lived six months. Then we got another one, and then he lived again. He's still there, mm -hmm. three years later. So um, um, most doctors are reluctant to provide that, that prescription for hospice care. And sometimes the families need to fight for it because even though they are not, they may not be dying uh, within six months, they benefit tremendously from hospice services. Okay. Now after a person passes away with dementia, the caregiver is left in a vacuum. It has been years by then, years, maybe 10, 15 years of devotion and dedication and occupying all your time with the needs of the dementia patient. And now he's gone and you're by yourself. What do you do with your time? What, you know, it's a whole new recovering system. The, the good thing is by then, you know, you have grieved so intensely for so long that many times the grief is already resolved. Uh, um, and, and, and people need help just stepping into their own skin again to become no longer the caregiver, but the individual that they are supposed to be. And we do that by honoring the achievements because a lot of people think, well, uh, you, you know that, that, that saying, you know, uh, the surgery was a success, but the patient died. Um, so people may feel like a failure. You know, he, he died, he's no longer with us. And um, the success is the everyday little battles and in making the patient feel comfortable, feel safe, and feel content, even though they may not understand the big picture, they are living in the moment. And that's the, the job of the caregiver. Baby boomers, we're going to be spending uh, our retirement years either with dementia or taking care of somebody with dementia. It's just the reality. Unless we find a cure, a good thing. Scientists all over the world are looking for that cure. And I am confident that there will be a cure. Um, some local resources, um, it's, it's good to know you're not alone. There's a, a lot of help out there. And all this is um, discussed in depth with practical uh, advice in the book that I put together because families really needed that information. And thank you. I'm open for questions if you... Physical exercise, good nutrition, good sleeping habits, lowering your stress levels. I'm just going through, through the points here, but each one of them is extremely important. And as far as um, cognitive exercises, uh, any cognitive exercise that involves your visual uh, cortex. So uh, crossword puzzles are nice, but they get old and your brain gets used to it. So uh, after you get familiar with them, you're not benefiting from them anymore. So those video games that the kids play nowadays, they are like, and things are flying at them and they have to respond. Those are the things that stimulate the brain. Yeah, yeah, and, and the benefits are uh, proven now to, uh, to last 15, 20 years down the line the protection. So if you want to do any cognitive exercise for your brain, select those that have visual uh, interference to them. But mostly people with dementia at stage seven, they lose all language skills. So it doesn't matter really what language they speak because it's going to be unintelligible sounds, if any.
whatever will work for that person. If honesty doesn't work, try just embellishing a little bit. I like to go with a positive, you know, a spin on it. You know, mom, my friend talked to me about this great doctor who is helping a lot of people with memory issues, and I think we should go. And, and this, this could be really great for you. They, you know, just do a positive spin to it. Um, if that doesn't work, um, you know, deceit. Uh, in Santa Barbara, per se, I'm, I'm not sure because we don't have those statistics, but we have them nationwide. And there is more incidence of um, Alzheimer's in particular in women than in men, and that's believed to be because women live longer. Um, and there is more in Hispanic, and even a higher incidence in uh, African American. And, and that's attributed to diet, dietary concerns. So when you say preventing, you know, look at your diet. It's important. So um, we don't know yet if it's a genetic component to it, but um, um, most things indicate this lifestyle. All of the dementia ones, all of them, there is not a test for it. There is not a test that say positive or negative. So we don't have those markers. We are working on finding those markers. So what the doctors do, they do a complete a, a very thorough examination, uh, brain scans, blood, you know, F, history, everything, and rule out, rule out cancer, rule out uh, liquids in the brain, rule out a number of other possibilities, rule out everything else that could be causing so dementia. Really then they look at the symptoms. Do the symptoms match Alzheimer's? Do the symptoms match Lewy bodies? Yeah. That's how they're doing the diagnosis. So diagnosis by omission. Yes, by omission and matching with the symptoms. The symptoms are different. The Alzheimer's Association is doing a really a nationwide campaign in educating primary caregivers. Um, so um, I trust that it's going to get better, but in any shape or form, always see a neurologist. Always see a neurologist. The neuropsychologists, they are good to find out the symptoms. Remember that I told that, you know, they do a thorough uh, evaluation and then match the symptoms. What symptoms? The symptoms are being brought by the neuropsychiatric evaluation. So, uh, so not just be a neurologist. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah, it's a team. Absolutely, yeah. Not, not easy, a little complex. That's why it's so difficult for the caregiver. Thank you guys so much for having me here. I appreciate it.